So it's a great pleasure to have Professor Hardy in our QSTM forum. And uh, uh, today he's going to give the 61st uh, QSTM talk and uh, this year's first talk in the series. He's the professor from Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics and also he's associated with University of Waterloo, which is at Ontario, Canada. And I don't need to give a big introduction to Professor Hardy because his uh, achievements are uh, like quite impressive in this uh, uh, the theoretical physics area, particularly uh, uh, in uh, the quantum theory, non-locality, and there are lots of uh, contribution he had given. Um, um, today he is going to speak about a very interesting uh, uh, topic. The title of the topic is the operational approach to physics. And uh, thank you, Professor Hardy, uh, uh, to uh, give your contribution in this forum. And uh, we are uh, welcoming you uh, from India. So you can start. Great. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for, for this uh, invitation. It's an impressive series that you're, you're running uh, and uh, I'm delighted to be part of it. Uh, I'm, I'm very keen for you to inter for people to interrupt if there are, are uh, questions while I'm speaking. Um, I'm going to uh, use this uh, whiteboard. I have a, a document camera here and uh, this is the first time I've done this but I'm hoping it's a way to sort of transcribe the, the blackboard experience that I prefer in a lecture hall uh, onto uh, into the Zoom uh, kind of setting. So we'll see how that uh, works. Um, um, so um, um, I want to talk about an operational approach to physics. Um, uh, and really the idea of an operational approach is that you, you start with, um, with what you see what, what you start with, what you do, and what you see. So you, in, in the laboratory, you, you you set up an apparatus. You you set various settings. You um you look at out. Okay, so you have the so choice of settings and and the outcomes, and that's and, and that's um and that's how it works. Um, so um and and then the the, the task of physics from that point of view. Is to is to provide uh, probabilities or predictions that pertain to those um, those uh, outcomes and settings. So that's the, the general point of view. Now, um, one question is, you know, is is this a um, is this somehow a sort of a, a different philosophy? Um, uh, is this a different philosophical approach uh, to doing physics? And uh, there's sort of two points of view. One 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 point of view is to say, well, actually. Um, this of the things we see and do is all there is. That's the full reality. But that's, that's not the point of view I take. Uh, my point of view is is that operationalism is a methodology uh, which will help you uh, gain uh, uh, a deeper insight into physics, and in particular, help you construct new physical theories that you didn't previously have. So, you know, so for me, it's an operational. It's a methodology. Um, and, um, and, you know, if you find, if you use this to construct a new physical theory, then perhaps you can gain deeper insight into the nature of, um, of reality uh, itself. Uh, and that's something that Einstein did very successfully uh, in, uh, in setting up um, the theory of relativity, especially in general. But he started with some very general, very basic operational ideas, uh, such as, you know, how do you measure... Um, measure um, time um, and um, or time intervals and and, um, intervals or, and and then the equivalence principle which was a very operational idea and he converted that into um, a theory that ultimately tells us something about the, the nature of uh, reality okay so where to start so this is a very general idea so let me um, let me um, just start with some very basic setting that we might consider so um, um, maybe I should say where this talk is going a little bit. Um, the idea is I'm going to talk about um, the very basic uh, uh, ideas of operationalism uh, in um, um, 
uh, show, show you some sort of sort of axioms that you can use to reconstruct quantum theory in that kind of setting. I'm going to then elaborate the um, this operational ideas a little bit more, so you can set up the theory of circuits, and that can be used to formulate quantum theory uh, in a deeper uh, fashion. Um, and then um, I'm um, going to talk about general relativity and, and also uh, so the problem of quantum gravity, the problems combining these two theories and, and, uh, and sort of an operational perspective on that. Um, and um, uh, I'll talk about um, formulating general relativity in an operational uh, uh, way. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, some issues of um, time symmetry I've been interested in uh, uh, recently and uh, may, if there's time, uh, talk about um, this is what I'm calling the quantum equivalence principle. Okay, let's uh, let's get back to um, the beginning. Operationalism. So here's a very basic scenario. Imagine we have some box okay, in the laboratory and uh, it has a button on it. You press this button and then a system, a quantum system comes out here. Uh, and then you have another box. Um, and this box has various uh, lights on it that uh, others uh, that can flash. So one of these lights will flash uh, um, and that constitutes the outcome. So this box here is your preparation. And this one here is your measurement. And these are the different outcomes. Now, actually, the preparation box can also have some outcomes on it. It's, that's fine. That's often, often you have that in a, in a preparation. If, if a preparation is, is regarded as successful, if perhaps the red light, um, and then each of these boxes can have some settings on it that you can imagine just some, some knobs one way or another, uh, and, and that gives you um, a setting. Okay, so the system passes from uh, this box to this box. Um, so how, um, how, let's get the right, how does one, um, how can one think about this situation? Well, let me, let me, um, first of all, consider an example in, um, in quantum theory. So here's an example in, um, quantum theory. Um, in quantum theory, imagine a, 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 sing, a two and a half particle, uh, represent a, a, a qubit. Um, and you can represent the density matrix associated with that spin and a half particle by uh, a two by two uh, matrix. Uh, and then the elements on this matrix are uh, the, the probability for spin up along the some, some given direction, that said direction, probability of spin down along that same direction. Then we have these off diagonal terms. Okay. Um, now um, you can show that um, um, these off diagonal terms have the form okay. Um, so, um, so A is a linear combination of the probability of getting spin up along the x direction, the probability of getting spin up along the y direction, and the two probabilities I mentioned before, the probability of spin up and down along the z direction. Uh, and oh, sorry, this. And I'm not 100% sure I've got the coefficients in this equation right, but uh, yeah. they're, they're right up to the convention of um, in your square root of minus one. Okay, so um, so so here we have um, the density matrix, the spin half particle. You can see it's actually given by four probabilities. Um, um, let's write this here. Um, So 
So these four probabilities here are sufficient to tell you um, every all the information that's in this density matrix uh, and vice versa. Okay, so so this object and that object are, are essentially equivalent. Um, they're also linear in each other. But important. Um, um, so any equation which is linear in the density matrix will be linear in this object E and vice versa. So, um, so if you want to calculate the probability uh, for a certain, so here's a prob the probability uh, in a situation like this where you pair, where you have a spin half um, uh, qubit paired in some density matrix, and then you make a measurement and you're looking at some outcome. The probability for that is given by the trace of an operator associated, positive operator associated with the outcome, let's call it, times a positive operator, or times the density matrix, Okay, that's the um, and that's the usual equation you have in quantum theory. So the trace rule uh, is just a way of writing Born rule in um, in um, in the language of density matrices. Um, and since P, this thing I introduced here, is linear in um, in rho, we can also write this down as the subproduct of some vector r. So, uh, Professor, trace rho is identity here. Sorry, say again, sorry? Trace of rho. Trace rho, ah, this is, this is an interesting point, uh, which I, I want to elaborate on. If it's the case that you don't have any different outcomes down here, uh -huh. okay, then trace of rho is the identity. That's the usual way of thinking. Yeah. Um, now, it turns out a better way of thinking is to say that trace of rho is equal to the probability associated with the outcome that you select on. Okay. Yeah. You, can, you can normalize the state afterwards if you want by dividing by trace of row. But if when you do that, you throw away some information and that information actually turns out to be quite useful. Okay. Um, yeah, so good question. Is that clear? Um, yeah. So, um, so you can see now, um, um, that that this this equation is is, is this equation here um, is equivalent to this equation, uh, and so now this object here is associated with the preparation. This object here is associated with the with the measurement with the the outcome of the measurement that you're interested in. Okay. Um, see, so. Um, are there any more questions before I move on? This is this is this is very very simple stuff. But uh, if, if there's any um, anything anyone wants to ask, about it, that would be useful. Okay, so maybe maybe just to uh, elaborate on on the on the the question that Sintan asked. Um, just Sintan asked just now. Um, so what we're calculating here is the joint probability of seeing some particular outcome here and some particular outcome here. Um, and, and so that's the reason that we don't want the density matrix to actually be um, normalized to trace one necessarily because the density matrix is, is it's, it's associated with a particular outcomes. So it's, 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 uh, the trace of that should be equal to the probability of that outcome if we ignore the future. If we don't consider anything else. Sorry, we don't also also look at something else. So, so, um, so this equation here is calculating a joint probability for some outcome on the preparation and also some measurement box. Okay, good. Um, so I have four of these um, whiteboards. Um, I bought them from the dollar store, so I can go back four slides if I need to. Okay. Um, so let me
continue here. Um, so I, I, show, I, I, sh I gave you the, the state, the quantum state by this. Is given by this object um, for a, for a, a spin half particle. Now um, it's it's interesting to to um, ask what the um, what what the set of possible vectors like this. Okay, in quantum theory, the constraint is that the density matrix has to have trace that is less than or equal to one. Um, and also the density matrix has to be a positive operator. Okay, if you uh, do some calculations, you can see that um, that those, those two constraints uh, give you the following constraints on, on, the, um, on, on these vectors. Okay, well, there are four components here, so I can't draw a diagram in four dimensions. So let me just take the, um, the case where the, where the density matrix, where the state is normalized. So this is a special case. Um, and I'm going to draw now uh, some axes. Those are some axes. And now I'm going to draw a box, uh, a cube that fits inside here. Okay. That's meant to be the, the unit Q. Um, and now if you take a, um, uh, a sphere ball and hit it just inside, so it just touches uh, all of the six faces of that cube. Okay, so that's difficult to draw. Uh, so that's meant to represent a ball, which is just touching each of the six faces of of the um, of the cube, the unique cube of one. Then the allowed states here are the ones where these probabilities, in this, in this case we're looking at the normalized case, where these probabilities are, are, are either on the ball, on the surface of the ball, or inside the ball. Okay. So those are the constraints on, um, on, on the allowed states in this case. Um, okay, great. Um, interesting to contrast this with the case of a, a bit, so a two-level classical system. So in that case, you can represent your, um, your state by a probability um, vector. Was there a question? Just a... okay. So in that case, you can represent your um, your state by a probability vector. This would be the probability of the state being zero, and the probability of the state being one. Uh, if it's normalized, then these two things add up to one. They don't have to be normalized. And then um, the, the allowed state space in that case is like this. Um, so these are the normalized ones here on this, on this straight line. And then all, all these points in here can be reached as well if you allow subnormalized um, states. Um, I should also I should say over here, because I had to impose this condition to draw a diagram, actually, what you really have is for each. Each value of pz plus pz minus. If you have if you have um, if you have the case where these two properties add up to a number that's less than one, then you also have this ball, but it's um, it's it's uh, corresponding. It's proportionally smaller, uh, and so you have a series of balls all the way down to the case where these two properties add up to one, and so that gives you a cone uh, where the top of the cone is a is a, a ball um, of, of unit size. So this contrasts the, the, the quantum case over here with the classical case over here. And one thing that's worth noticing is, is that the, um, in the quantum case, any point on the surface here is a pure state. So here's a point just on the surface of, this, of, the, of the ball. Um, 
and it's a pure state. What I mean by pure is it's not possible to write that state down as a probabilistic mixture of other states. So you have here a continuous set of, of pure states, all these, all these states on the surface of the sphere are continuous. On the other hand, in the classical case, um, you have a discrete set of pure states. If the state is pure, uh, that corresponds to the, um, the, the bit being in the state one. And this state is pure, it corresponds to the bit being in the state zero. Um, and then all these states here in between are mixtures. Um, and, and likewise, everything in here. Uh, conventionally, this, this state here is also extremal in, in, a set, in the sense of a convex set. Um, so you could, you could be pure in principle, but usually I don't call the state pure. It's just this, it's the, the case where these two properties are zero. Um, okay. So this gives you some idea of the difference between these two cases. In the, ca in, in the case of a classical system, you have a discrete set of, um, of pure states. In the case of a quantum system, you have a continuous set. Um, okay, so that, that was some very general, so, so that was just some consideration for quantum theory and I contrasted it with the case in quantum theory, the classical property theory. Um, so now, now let's look um, at the situation for probabilistic theories in general. So let me, let me just tell you what the strategy here is. We want to reconstruct quantum theory from the basic set of axioms, then we need um, we need um, to have a um, um, we need to have some broader framework in which to do that. So uh, I'm going to give you a broader framework and then show you how you might reconstruct quantum theory in that context. Oh. So um, So I'm going to take that picture I did before. We have here a preparation uh, and um, a um, and uh, we have uh, a measurement uh, box. We have various outcomes in each of these boxes. And now, sorry, the camera is having some difficulty focusing. My hand is there. Um, right. The um, so um, so let's let's um, define a state associated with this preparation. State is associated with this preparation here. Um, I, want, I want a state to be um, equivalent to something that you can use to calculate the probability. For any a measurement, any preparation measurement situation like this, any possible measurement you might put in here. So a state should be able to give you the probabilities for any situation. So I've just written an alpha here, that's meant to go over all the possible knob settings and all the possible um, uh, outcomes in the boxes. This is a list of all the possible probabilities you might want to calculate. Um, for this this situation, um, in the case of in the case of the qubit I just gave, the the, the state would have to give you the properties of all the different um, measurements you might make on that um, spin half part. Now, this is a lot of information, and fortunately, physical theories usually have some. Um, some um, structure in them, but it's possible to go down to a, a smaller object list of um, of probabilities um, uh, associated with a fiducial set of um, of um, of measurement situation.
Okay, so we have here, uh, so I, so for, sorry, P, P1, the one would correspond to a particular measurement along with some associated outcome. Then the two might correspond to a different measurement with some outcome and so on, all the way down to K. And we, see, we saw an example of this already, um, where uh, in the case of quantum, of a qubit uh, or a spin half particle, uh, list of probabilities could be um, um, the first one could be spin up, the probability spin up along the z direction, so one would correspond to spin up along the z direction, two spin down along the z direction, and then um, you need two more in that case, spin x plus and spin y plus. Okay, so this is a much more general concept, uh, and this would pertain this would pertain to probabilistic theories in general, quantum theory. Okay. Um, great. Um, and one concept you have here is n. Sorry, is k. K is the number of probabilities that are required to specify the state. And of course, you should choose this set to be as small as as possible. You choose K to be the smallest value as possible. Um, <clears throat> great. Um, once you've got this, then you can calculate the probability. Uh, and you're going to insist on calculating it by a linear formula, like this. So the probability is given by uh, the dot product of some vector r associated with the measurement and some vector p, which gives the state and that's associated with the operation. And this gives you the joint, joint probability of seeing a particular outcome here associated with this state and a particular outcome here associated with this vector r. Okay. Um, so here's, here's another concept I want to introduce. This is the notion of n. So n is the maximum number of, of, of states that can be perfectly discriminated. What do I mean by that? Um, so here we have various different states for a system. Um, so here's one state. Um, um, and then here's another state and so on for the system. Uh, and gen in general, a set of states can be discriminated if you can find a box M with outcomes on it. Okay, this is a measurement box, such that for each of the states uh, in your set, uh, you get a different outcome. So an example of that would be uh, in quantum theory, you have spin half particle. Um, then you could have a preparation spin up along the z direction and spin down along the z direction. Uh, and those boxes can be discriminated by a measurement that measures in the z direction. And you have two different lights that flash according to whether you get spin up or spin down. In the case of this one, you would get spin up. And in the case of this one, you get spin down. Um, so there you would have n equal to two. Uh, in general, when you compare this, these general ideas with quantum theory, um, n is the dimension of the Hilbert space. Okay. n is Is that, so n is the maximum number of states that can be eliminated in a, in a single shot measurement. Okay. Are there any questions at the stage? Okay. Great. Uh, okay. So there's one more situation I want to describe here, and that is the um, Imagine you have not just a preparation and a measurement, but you also have a box in the middle. 
which performs a transformation. So now you have preparation, transformation, and a measurement. Okay. Uh, how do you describe that situation? Um, well, you can describe it in the following way. You can say, um, prepare a state comes in here, then after the transformation, you have a new state coming uh, here. Uh, and um, and then so that so there's some map on the on the state as it goes through this transformation box. Um, P goes to a new state. Prime. Um, so. so just the temptation to use my hand. Uh, so P goes to new state P prime, and then you can show that this is just a linear map. Represent the linear map by some matrix Z acting on. Uh, so, uh, so transformation affects a linear map on on your state. Now what I want to do is um, is I'm going to tell you some of the the, the set of um, of axioms you can use, uh, and from these axioms you can rederive or reconstruct um, um, the basic um, um, basic um, framework of quantum theory. Okay. Um, There are, there are four axioms, or five axioms. I'll give you the names of the axioms first and a brief description, and then I'll give you a bit more detail afterwards. So the first axiom, uh, I call it the information axiom, and it says uh, that any state which has, or is constrained to have, a certain information carrying capacity uh, has the same properties as any other state having that given information carrying capacity. Um, and uh, so an example uh, of that is, you know, we're all very used to, to classical information. So, for example, uh, if you um, if you have a, a memory stick it has a certain information carrying capacity, so it can carry, you know, say uh, two two gigabytes, um, and um, and then um, you can transfer that into your all that information into your onto a certain section of the hard drive. Uh, uh, and if you constrain yourself to part of the high hard drive that carries two, um, two um, gigabytes, then you have the same properties, the same constraints uh, on states and informations and, and measurements uh, in each of those cases. So, so the, the physical way you, um, you instantiate, uh, the way you store uh, information, that doesn't really matter so far as the, the properties um, and um, the same is true in quantum theory. If you have um, two, two quantum systems, which, uh, for example, have an information carrying capacity of, of log three, in other words, they are dimensional Hilbert spaces, um, then those two systems have the same properties. They have the same Hilbert space, the, the same set of density matrices, the same set of possible transformations on them, the same um, uh, uh, cost of operators measurement outcomes. All of these properties are the, are the same in the two cases. That seems like a very, um, very basic uh, principle. Furthermore, if you had one system that had an information carry capacity of uh, one, one, two constant systems, one had a Hilbert space of three, uh, dimension three, the other one had a Hilbert space of dimension five, but you constrained yourself so that uh, you only ever 
looked at states which had support on three-dimensional um, part of that other space, then the three-dimensional, uh, the, the, then the two cases would behave in the same way. Um, so that's the first uh, axiom. The second axiom is something I'm gonna call informational locality. Um, and um, information locality uh, is the principle that if you have um, two devices that can carry information, uh, then you add the information carrying capacity. So if you have, for example, a, a, two, a two gigabyte memory stick and a five gigabyte memory stick, uh, then the total information carrying capacity is is two plus two plus five percent is, is, is one of those two numbers. Okay. Uh, now, um, I, I just introduced this number n, and the log of n is the information that carrying capacity, because that's n is the total number of states that can be distinguished. So the log of that is the information carrying capacity. Um, so if I just work in terms of n, what information locality is telling me is that n of a b, a, a composite system, is equal to n of I'm going to use different notations here. If you have a composite system AB, then N for the composite system is equal to NA and B, like so. So it's the product. If I take the log of this equation, then I get that it's the sum. Okay. Please uh, interrupt if you have uh, uh, any questions. Okay. So next we have. Um, Uh, information um, tomography. Sorry. We have uh, tomographic. Hello. Hello, Professor. Hello, yes. Yes. Uh, so, uh, regarding the second point, so what I understand is that for a composite system, the information is just the sum of the two individual yes. systems, right? Yes. Yeah. Right, so I mean, I, I couldn't like see it physically, like, like doesn't like adding two systems add more to the information? Like, don't they have more information than the uh, separate ones? Yeah, so good point. Um, but it's also for the next point, this, this question will be relevant too as well. Um, so it's true, um, if I take two systems, you know, A and B, um, these two systems um, in, in quantum theory, for example, you can have entangled states and those entangled states can not be understood in terms of a state for system A and a state for system B separately. Um, however, um, it's still the case that the, um, the, the um, Hilbert space dimension of the composite system product of the Hilbert space dimension of system A and system B. Uh, is that clear? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so what's interesting is that although quantum theory has some strange non-separable properties, non-local properties, um, uh, it is also quite local in big ways, um, and um, and 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 that's that's very nice. Um, you could consider violating this principle. You could say that when I put two quantum systems together, then I get additional um, distinguishable states, um, uh, but that that isn't what happens in quantum theory. You could construct models where that does happen, but it's not what happens in quantum theory. Um, okay. Okay. So tomographic locality. Um, well, tomographic locality is the same thing, but for K. What that's saying is, if you take the number of probabilities you require to specify the state, I'll just um, take you back to the previous uh, slide. So here's the number of probabilities required to specify a, a, a state. So now you form a composite system, so AB, uh, then tomographic locality tells you that the number of um, probabilities you require for the composite state 
is the product of the numbers you require in the states uh, separately. Uh, and this is true in quantum theory. In incidentally, it's only true in quantum theory uh, for the case, the special case where you have complex numbers, uh, where your Hilbert space is built on top of complex numbers. Um, it's not true uh, if, for example, you build, build your Hilbert space uh, with real numbers or with uh, quaternions, and then this is. This property might be taken to be um, a consequence. So the, so the fact that we have complex numbers in quantum theory might be taken to be a consequence of this property of tomographic locality. Uh, and I've given it the name tomographic locality. Uh, that's because um, it has a, uh, a particular interpretation. Imagine I have a preparation now for a composite system, so I have, um, this is preparing a system A and system B. This box has two systems coming out of it. Uh, and imagine I want to determine the state associated with this um, system. Um, well, to determine the state, you, you could make various measurements and measure various probabilities. Uh, and if you measure the, um, um, the probabilities in, in some, in some fiducial set, and you will determine the state. Um, but the property of tomographic locality says that it's actually sufficient to consider uh, measurements which are separate measurements on each of these two sy systems. Um, so uh, your, your measurements can consist of a measurement on system A and a measurement on system B. When you look at the joint probabilities uh, for those, um, for the outcome of those measurements. Uh, and you can use that uh, to, to do tomography on the state, to come in the state. Uh, and, and that assumption is equivalent to this assumption that the A uh, the composite is equal to the product of the use of each of the separate systems. And again, this is something which is true in quantum theory by virtue of the fact that we use complex numbers. Okay. Um, So, so another axiom is the continuity axiom. So what the continuity axiom says is that, um, is that there exists a continuous reversible transformation between any two pure states. So, um, so remember in the case of, um, of a qubit over here in quantum theory, the pure states uh, are continuously connected on the surface of this, of this ball. Uh, and uh, you can find a transformation which will take you continuously from any one pure state to any other pure state. Uh, so you can find a reversible transformation. Um, and, and so we're gonna elevate that to the level of an axiom say that there exists a continuous reversible transformation between any pair of pure states. Okay. Um, and then finally, um, we have the um, uh, uh, final axiom is a simplicity axiom. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain the axiom in a bit more detail uh, on, on the next, um, next uh, slide. So this uh, simplicity axiom is basically that we take the simplest uh, theory in a hierarchy of theories that are consistent with these um, axioms. Any, any more questions, Steve? Professor, could you please elaborate the fourth one, this continuity axiom, a little bit? Yeah. So, um, so if, imagine you have two pure states, two uh, preparations associated with states. Those states are pure. Um, 
pure means that they cannot be regarded as a as a as a probabilistic mixture of other states. Okay, so you have two two states which are pure, uh, and uh, now the idea is there exists a, a transformation between the two of them, which has two properties. It's um, it's reversible, uh, and furthermore, um, it's continuous. So it takes you you can parameterize it so it takes you. Uh, through a, you know, you can build it out of lots of small transformations, let's say, which are reversible, obviously from one pure state to the other. Um, and the illustration is best illustrated on, on this diagram where you can sort of go continuously from any one pure state to any other pure state along the surface of the ball. So in the case of a, of a spin half particle, you would do that by rotating your, your system. Is that clearer? Yeah. Mathematically, it ends up corresponding to the idea that there exists a, um, a, group, um, a, a, a there's a group of transformations, um, and and that group um, uh, it can be regarded as, as a Lie group. It's built out of uh, built, built out of uh, infinitesimal generators. Um, and it's this continuity axiom which which really forces quantum theory. Because uh, in the classical case, you can see that you have um, a discrete set of pure states. So there's no way to go continuously from this pure state to this pure state. Um, right. The, um, Let me just talk a little bit about this uh, simplicity axiom. So we have um, a, 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 B equals K, A, K, B, uh, and N, A, K, B equals N, A, B. We can show using um, the, the first axiom, the information axiom, A, is a function of n. Um, that's because k is a property of a system, and and um, and properties should be given by the information current capacity. We can also show that k of n plus one is greater than uh, k of n. Um, um, now, if we take this property here. And, and combine it with these two, then what we get is that with some function k of n a and b, which is like this, uh, functions that have this property are called completely multiplicative. Uh, and if you also use this this property that the function is strictly increasing. Then after a little bit of number theory, you can show that k um, is equal to n to the power r. R is some uh, integer. OK. Um, And, and now let's consider let's consider the, the, some cases in this hierarchy. So the first case, k equals n. So that's where r equals one. Um, is classical property theory. Um, uh, you can see that you know, I, I gave you one example where you had a classical bit, and then you have two distinguishable states. Uh, and the size, number of properties you require in your list is two, uh, but this works in, in general. So if you have um, n distinguishable states, uh, then then the, the number of properties you require is one for each of those distinguishable states. So k is equal. The next case is quantum theory. Uh, 
Um, and in quantum theory, um, the, the number of properties you require to specify your state is equal to the dimension squared. Um, okay. And uh, I could show you why that's true. My, my daughter is here. Okay. Let me show you, um, let me show you um, why that's true. In general, in quantum theory, I have a density matrix. And I have some probabilities down the diagonal, and these are the probabilities associated with the outcomes of a measurement onto some basis set. So that goes from one up to N. Then I have lots of off diagonal entries. Uh, and so if you count the number of real numbers in here, uh, well, then that's equal to n, because I have these numbers down in the diagonal, plus above the diagonal, I have complex numbers, those carry to two real numbers. And then the, there are n times n minus one over two uh, entries above the diagonal. The numbers below the diagonal are just the same numbers to the complex you get taken, so there's no new real numbers down here. Uh, and if you do this sum, you get n squared. So the number of real numbers required to specify the density matrix is equal to n squared, but that's just the same as the number of probabilities required to specify the state. So, um, so you can see um, that we have the first two, right? the first two um, entries in this um, hierarchy are classical problem theory and quantum theory. Um, and um, and one question that naturally arises is, what about the next one? What about um, k equals n cubed, k equals n four, and so on? Are the physical theories uh, that correspond to that? those ones and uh, there's been lots of work on this uh, over the last uh, couple of decades um, and, and uh, no one's really successfully constructed a, a compelling model for anything above a equals n squared but it's possible there are interesting probabilistic theories um, n cubed, n four, etc but no one's really found a, a very compelling example um, now if one if someone did find a compelling example then it's further possible that you would have a kind of um, super decoherence. So um, in the example here, if you go from quantum theory to classical probability theory, uh, there exists um, a restriction on quantum states um, that they are decohered so that they have, um, um, so that uh, they are diagonal, the density matrix is diagonal on some particular basis. And then they behave like cl classical states. So there's a kind of decoherence that takes you from the quantum case to the classical case. And, and that's essential because if that weren't true, um, then, um, then, then it wouldn't be possible to have a quantum level of description and a classical level of description. But it's possible that one of these higher theories uh, uh, has something like a sort of super decoherence into the quantum case. So then you would have. Um, um, a, a, um, and it would be possible that actually these higher theories are, are, are um, possible candidates for a real physical theory in nature. So that's, that's just some mathematical speculation. Okay. okay. So um, let me just show you these, these axioms again. Okay, so we have these different axioms. Um, 
So there's a, there's a construction. I have a paper from 2001 on the archive. Uh, and um, in this paper, uh, I show how to reconstruct quantum theory from a set of acts, this set of atoms. Um, I'm not going to go through all the details of that construction right, right now. Um, but but the basic idea is that you 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 first of all you you construct quantum theory for the case of the of the qubit for a two-level system, you get the ball, and then you use that to construct the general case. Okay, so um that that's a, a general topic. Um I'm gonna go back and then move on to a different topic. Um um so if there are any questions on this reconstruction uh please ask them now so um after after i did this uh, work on reconstructing quantum theory um uh, so when I did that, I was in Oxford, and then I got recruited to, to come to Perimeter Institute. Uh, and a lot of people here at Perimeter Institute are interested in the problem of quantum gravity. Um, and so I, naturally, I, I asked myself whether uh, this kind of general approach to quantum theory might be consistent with, um, or might might provide a way to uh, to attack the problem of quantum gravity. Um, so. Let me just talk first of all about the problem of quantum gravity. Um, the problem of quantum gravity is to find a, phys a physical theory that reduces inappropriate limits to, um, to quantum theory on the one hand um, and to general relativity on the other hand. Uh, so this physical theory um, um, it could be something which is much more general than either of these two um, theories, but it has to have the properties that it reduces to them in, 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 um, in some limit uh, of the theory. Um, so um, how would one go about attacking this kind of problem, uh, especially if one was interested in, in this sort of operational approach? Um, well, of course, this is difficult. And I don't, I don't really have the answer. Um, but I have a, a general sort of framework and some ideas that I want to talk about. Uh, okay. First of all, let me say a few more things about this problem. Um, what you have here is a situation where you have two less fundamental theories, um, general relativity and quantum theory, and you're trying to construct uh, a more general theory which is um, theory of quantum gravity. Each of these less fundamental theories has what may be regarded as conservative and radical features. So um, the quantum theory, so general relativity is conservative in the sense that it is a deterministic theory. Um, if you have um, sufficient information about the initial state, in some sense, then you can determine um, all, the, all the physically relevant quantities thereafter. Quantum theory, on the other hand, is, is radical in its respect and, uh, because it is inherently probabilistic. Okay, um, so so these two theories are, are different here. On the other hand, general relativity is radical in that it has um, it has um, dynamical causal structure. So what I mean by that is that the um, that the metric um, is a, a dynamically determined quantity in relativity. So if you want to find a solution 
to the Einstein, to the, to the, to the field equations of general relativity, then you need to um, you need to solve for the metric and the other fields. Uh, but the metric is something that gives you the causal structure. It tells you whether two events are like or time-like separated, and it imposes a, a, a kind of a foliation of events that are before and after. Uh, this is the dynamically determined in general relativity. On the other hand, in quantum theory, the causal structure is fixed. So if you look at this table, then it seems that if you're going to find a theory of quantum gravity, most likely you will have to take a radical route. We're looking for a theory which has dynamical causal structure uh, and is inherently probabilistic. Um, actually, it, it might be a bit, you might have a bit more than that. Uh, in quantum theory, any quantity that is subject to variation uh, is also subject to uh, indefiniteness. So, for example, uh, if you have a, a double, a double slit experiment and a particle can go through one slit or another, another slit, um, then, um, then there is a quantum superposition of you going through this slit or this slit, and you have, um, um, you have, um, there's no matter of the fact in some sense as to whether the particle went through the top slit or the bottom slit. You have indefinite causal structure. So, and so you have an indefiniteness with regard to which path it takes. In the case of quantum gravity, now the metric would become uh, a quantity that you need to consider, and it would be a quantity that's that dynamical. So as a consequence, you would expect to have something like indefiniteness in the metric. Definiteness. He'd have indefinite uh, causal structure, and um, and um, this is this is a big deal if you think about it. Um, and let me try to explain why. Normally in physics, we're used to the idea that you um, you evolve a state forward in time. Okay, so you have some state at a given time t, and then you evolve it forward, and you uh, in, in so doing you um, you're able to make predictions. Uh, if you have indefinite causal structure, then that means that the very idea of a space-like surface uh, state at a given time doesn't make any sense anymore. So this, this stops making sense. So you can't think in terms of this picture of a state at a given time uh, evolving forward in time. So indefinite causal structure is, is much more radical um, than the departure that was forced by, um, by uh, Einstein from, you know, from uh, abandoning the idea of a simultaneous now, at least in general relativity, you can still think in terms of foliation, you can still think in terms of a state evolving in time. But if you take seriously um, this, um, this property, uh, then you have to um, abandon even the idea that you can evolve a state forward in time. Uh, and so the question is, how are you going to um, construct the theory uh, in, in that context? Any questions? And so the quantum filter will be the result of such a theory or? Say that again, sorry. So will will the quantum field theory QFT okay. be the result of such a model or how? Well, um, okay, um, maybe, but no, probably not. So if, if, you, if you look here at the problem of quantum gravity, I, I, I could have said the, the, the problem is the quantum theory that Problems to find a theory of quantum gravity that reduces to to quantum field theory um, on the one hand, uh, at least a, at least a specialist quantum field theory. 
uh, and to um, general relativity on the other hand. Um, what we don't know is, is what the theory is going to be like. Now, it could be, and I think much of the research on quantum gravity assumes that this, this theory is also a quantum field theory. Uh, but it could also be that this theory is, 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 is has quite a bit from, from um, quantum field theory or, or, or from general relativity, it might be a, a much deeper theory. Uh, so uh, historically, um, maybe this is maybe it's worth, this, this is a good question, so maybe I, I should just take a slight diversion. Uh, just a little bit. Um, So the problem of unifying um, two different physical theories and a new physical theory has been um, considered in the past. Uh, and here's an example. Uh, when Einstein, Einstein um, had a problem when he was working on general relativity. And his problem was that on the one hand, he had Newtonian gravity. Uh, and on the other hand, he had um, uh, special relativity. Uh, you might say he had special relativistic field theories because he knew um, he had electromagnetism uh, and, and probably by then people were starting to work on special relativistic fluid dynamics as well. So, um, so over here, these are special relativistic field theories. Uh, and the problem was that Newtonian gravity didn't fit into this framework. He had various arguments as to why that was the case. So he realized he needed a, a new physical theory uh, that was used in special limits to special relativistic field theories on the one hand and to Newtonian gravity on the other hand. Uh, and, um, and you know, eventually, of course, he found the theory of general relativity. So this is an example where someone solved this problem of finding a deeper theory used in special limits to two to different theories. So, um, and, and general relativity theory, while it, while it is a field theory, it's actually very different in nature from special relativistic field theories. It has a much you know, broader concept. It has the concept of, um, of a metric. It has the concept of general coordinates. Uh, you have uh, general manifolds and so on. So this is a much deeper theory than special relativity uh, is. Um, and so uh, it's possible that um, we'll have the same kind of thing here. So theory of quantum gravity may be much deeper than quantum field theory um, uh, in, in some Sense. Of course, we don't know what this is, but that. that um, so, but the sort of the, the the ideas that I'm exploring are to look in a much broader mathematical framework, this sort of operational framework, of general probabilistic theories, to try and find what's the right framework uh, uh, for the theory of quantum gravity, uh, and then apply some principles or whatever to try and construct the theory of quantum gravity. Principles. So that's a sort of general kind of strategy. Does that does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. And I also saw some paper where they obtain like a Dirac equation using operational principles. So, uh, oh right, that's yeah probably the the Pavia group. So Mara Dariano, um, oh, yes. Palatti, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so so um, suddenly um, you know we 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 think along similar lines. A general in general philosophy we have. Uh, attitude. Um, so there has been a lot of work, uh, especially by those guys, uh, quantum field theory and operational principles. Um, but then the question of quantum gravity is, is one step beyond that. You may have, a, you have this problem of indefinite causal property. Yes, okay, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so, um, So how do you do that? How do you find a, a general mathematical framework which is capable of admitting indefinite causal structure? But you, you don't have a, so you don't, you can't allow a state evolving in time. Um, and um, yeah, that that's 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 difficult. So I I, um, I wrote a paper, a few papers starting in two thousand and five. Which I think I called the causal induction, the causal formulation.
because of Islamism. Um, and um, I'll, I'll just give you a, a sort of an overview of how that works. I'm not going to go into, into great detail because it would take too long than as I want to talk about. Um, Okay, so um, so if we don't have um, um, a sort of fixed background causal structure or, or even just a foliation, uh, so we have the notion of before and after and so on, then how are we going to proceed? The one way to think is to imagine that we have um, lots of elementary regions uh, and there's a, there's a way of thinking in terms of thinking operationally about this. Uh, each of these regions has associated with us a setting uh, uh, and an outcome. And also has some, some marker called X, which gives you a kind of position. Okay, so there's, we have a, um, setting an outcome and then some marker that gives you a position. So each of these regions has that. I know how to get in. Just one second, sorry. Um, are you are you okay? So Helen, are you going to go downstairs? Helen, you go downstairs and do your own class. Because then you got to do your class downstairs, okay? okay? Helen, there's already a computer downstairs set up for you. Okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm, there's, um, the children are home from school at the moment uh, because of the uh, COVID restrictions. Okay. Um, so, um, so let me, um, let me, um, yeah. Each of these, each of these uh, yeah. elementary regions associated with it, a setting, an outcome, and some parameter x that um, uh, tells you, uh, sort of gives you some position information, some position information. But don't assume any particular causal structure on these different regions. We're not assuming that this is before this is to a space like nothing like that. Um, so how are we going to build a physical theory um, that can uh, make sense of the situation? Okay, so one thing we can do is, so we have many of these, and this is the full set of the ones we want to consider. So one thing we can do is we can just draw a circle around some of them, we call that region A. So this, I'm gonna call this region A. And um, and, and um, we can, and then we have the region that's not A here. And so we can ask ourselves, what's the probability um, C, um, we see various, um, let me see, what's the probability that we see all the outcomes in region A and also all the outcomes in region not A, given the settings in region A and the settings in region not A. Okay. So this is really, um, just the probability of seeing all the outcomes in all of these regions. So we split them up and split it up into two regions, A and not A. And uh, it's, the situation is reminiscent of the situation I drew before, where we had a preparation and a measurement. So, um, and what I want to do is I want to regard not A as the preparation, A as, as the measurement. Um, 
So I'm going to regard everything that happens outside of A as if it were a preparation for what happens inside of A. If I do that, I can write down the uh, a vector. Um, I can write down. I can write it down like this. Okay. So now I'm just regarding um, what happens. Uh, I'm regarding um, region not A as a preparation for region A. Okay. Now let's imagine I'm interested in the probability of some particular thing happening in region A, given settings in region A. Um, well, I could try to write that down um, as okay, I'm running out of space here. I'm sorry. I could try to write that down like this. Like so, so, what I'm doing is I'm writing down the probability of just seeing what I see in region A as as the probability, the joint probability, divided by um, um, divided by the um, sum of all different things I might see in region A. Okay. Um, so this is really just basic uh, probability theory. Um, uh, similar to taking some kind of partial trace over a bar. Uh, no, sorry, a bar is um, a partial trace. Oh, I see. Um, yes, you can think of it as a partial trace. This thing here is a bit like a partial trace over just the a. So you're left with a bar on the bottom in the denominator. But really, all I'm doing is I'm I'm, I'm using uh, I'm, I'm using sort of basic rules of, of probability theory. So I'm just um, writing this down as the um, joint probability divided by the probability of, of only a bar. Um, let, me, let, me, let me write it down again in certain notation. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll skip the settings because that just makes it more complicated. So, Um, I'm just introducing, um, so this, this, is, this is just a basic formula in, in, in um, probability theory, except I should distinguish this variable here from this one, which is a dummy variable. So I'm putting a tilde on top of it. Um, so all I'm doing here is calculating the probability of A by taking the joint probability and dividing by the probability of A bar. Okay. So that's just a very basic thing you can do in, in um, quantum, in, in probability theory. Um, and now, in, in terms of the things I've written down before, I can write this as the probability of, I can write this top thing as,
like this. And now here comes the, the crunch. This thing actually, uh, this probability for A um, won't be, will depend on what's happening in the region A bar, unless um, this vector here, unless this vector here is parallel to this vector here. If these two vectors are not parallel, then um, it matters what preparation you have in region A bar. Okay. So, um, so what we have is um, we have a condition that says that the probability is is well defined. Uh, only if this vector here is parallel to this vector. Okay. Because if they're not parallel, then um, it will matter what vector you take the top one. And, um, and then if the two vectors are parallel, so probability is well defined, and the probability is just equal to the ratio of the lengths of these vectors, because this dot product doesn't really matter anymore. So what what's happened here is we have a way of calculating a probability uh, in this very general kind of situation here, um, where we don't have any definite causal structure. We haven't said what the causal relationship is between these different quantities, um, and um, we can calculate. We can calculate the. Um, we can kick. Yeah, and we can. We have a way of calculating probabilities in this context. Um, and the the calculation of probabilities is kind of a two stage calculation. First of all, we have a condition. If the probability is well defined in the first place, and then if the probability is well defined, then we have a way to calculate what that probability is equal to. Um, and uh, so this might all seem a little bit abstract. However, um, it's a very, um, it's a very, um, it's a very general um, kind of formulation. And you can apply it in situations where you don't have definite causal structure. You don't need to think in terms of a state of all the time. Um, and you can elaborate on this um, approach. So um, I drew a situation where we have um, lots of these elementary regions. So we could take, instead of just taking one region, we could take two regions A and B. And now we can ask uh, what's the probability or seeing some outcome in region A and some outcome in region B, given the, the various settings. Um, and to do that, we need to work with an object uh, RAB. Okay. Um, uh, which now it's just the same thing because we have a competitive region. Uh, we have, um, we're going to represent it like this. And you can show that this object RAB can be written as a, as a bilinear product of, um, try to say this, RA and RB. So this is meant to represent a bilinear product of RA and RB. Um, so in particular, I take the components of um, AB, of RAB. Um, um, then 
what we have is they are given by Uh, some matrix multiplying um, um, so some matrix multiplying uh, the components of R A and R B. Um, so th this is this is very important because this gives you a way to combine composite regions into um, into um, into a single region, uh, and previously uh, we had we had techniques for doing that in, in quantum theory, but they always depended on the particular causal structure. Um, so, to give an example, um, Here's an example in quantum theory. Imagine you have two qubits and they're passing through, um, they're passing uh, through some boxes. Um, so this qubit is just passing through box A, this qubit is passing through box B, through box, and through box C. Um, you can think of each of these as being one of these elementary regions uh, in, in the diagram I did before. So you have settings and outcomes. And so now, um, um, in quantum theory, how do we combine these objects? And um, roughly speaking, what we do is if we have A and B like this, we take operators associated with A and B and we put a tensor product to it in. Okay. Um, if we have um, C and if we have B and C, then what we do is we just multiply them. Um, and if we have B and D, well, you can define uh, an object, what I call the question mark product has the property that it acts on some other operator, it returns um, the um, product of those operators like this. Okay, we have, um, we have three different rules binding mathematical objects in this situation. Whereas over here, we have a single rule. The only thing that changes is we need to have a different um, matrix in, in, in the different cases. Okay. So, um, and, and now uh, if you want to understand a theory, it become, the theory it becomes about the question, where do you get these matrices from? How do you calculate these different matrices? And um, and um, and uh, the way and and so um, and that really I mean something I haven't fully understood, but. Um, what you can do is define a set which consists of all these matrices, of different situations. And now you can find some rules that relate these matrices. So you don't have to specify all the matrices for every situation, you can relate them to each other. Uh, and so there's a lot of mathematics in trying to understand how these matrices that provide the bilinear product to different pairs of regions uh, are related. Uh, and so this thing here, I call it the causal loop. And um, and so I think there's there's more work to be done on this. I, I'm working at the moment with my student uh, Nitika Sakawada, 
uh, on uh, on uh, elaborating this uh, framework. There may be a paper out on that uh, at some point soon. Okay, so I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on to a different topic. So are there any questions on, on this topic at this stage? Hello. Hello, yep. Um, can you explain this causal light again, please? Yeah. Um, so there's a few steps here. So first of all, um, we want to find a way to do probabilistic calculations for, for general um, sets of these elementary regions without assuming any given causal structure between the elementary regions. And then as part of that, we want to be able to combine um, um, the calculations for, for regions, for pairs of regions. Okay. Um, and so, um, so to do that, we, we can do it taking this bilinear product. And this is a very general um, feature, and it, in some sense, it, it um, it's it's more general than the kind of situation we have in quantum theory, where we, where we have different types of product for each causal equation. We have these these matrices um, here, which control the bilinear product, uh, and um, the quadriloid uh, is um, is uh, you could think of the quadriloid as a set of all such matrices, except that actually these matrices are um, are constrained; uh, they're related to one another, and so you don't have to give all of the matrices. It's sufficient to give a subset of the matrices. Um, and in, in the paper, I show how to set up this causaloid in the case of um, quantum theory. Okay. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, that, that's, that's, as, that's my best. And does that, does that provide any extra clarity? Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions on this? So one of the problems with the approach I just described to you is it's sort of a bit too general and a bit too abstract. Um, and so um, and so um, a real question is 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 how to do something more concrete um, but still take that philosophy uh, that you should treat different regions on a similar footing. So um, I'll describe to you um, an approach I've taken recently, more recently. So, um, so the, this is where you build a uh, circuit. So um, the basic building block of a circuit is um, um, a thing like this. This is a, um, an operation. Uh, and so here's the idea. Imagine you, you go into the laboratory uh, and there's an experiment. There's lots of apparatuses. Uh, and and uh, so you, you, one of these apparatuses may have you know, some box maybe some box like this. And the box has various uh, holes in it, top and on the bottom. Um, and these holes can be used to send system in and out of it. Um, and um, so, 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 so that box uh, was manufactured um, to be used in a certain prescribed way. Uh, for example, this box may be it's uh, a box and um, um, photons, uh, maybe a photon in here, a, an electron in here, a, uh, a photon is supposed to come out here and uh, an electron out here. So, so that box is supposed to be used in a prescribed way. Uh, and the idea of an operation is to formalize that. So you say you have different systems Uh, 
um, which go in and come out. Uh, and uh, this, this constitutes your operation. Also, the box may have on it certain um, settings, certain knob settings. Uh, and so here you have a, a setting associated with this operation. And the box may also have you know, lights of different colors that can flash, you know, red light, blue light, um, whatever other. These are the outcomes. So over here, you have uh, also an outcome. So this is a basic uh, object in this object in the circuits. Uh, and then the idea is that you wire these things together to make a circuit. So here's an example of a circuit. Okay. Um, then we have some wires, some type system types in each of these wires. Like so. Um, so here is a circuit. The circuit has the prob the property that it's um, it's closed. So there's no wires left sticking out. Um, and each of these boxes has um, some spe setting already specified and a particular outcome specified as well. So what we can do is we can calculate the probability associated with this circuit. So the probability is the joint probability that an outcome, you see an outcome here, see an outcome here, see an outcome here, see an outcome here. Um, and um, in this, in this operational approach, our objective is to be able to calculate these um, probabilities. Any any questions? Okay. Um, so this this is a sort of diagrammatic notation for the circuit, and this is meant to represent dramatically something that happens actually in the laboratory. We can represent the same thing um, symbolically. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm just adding subscripts, scripts. The time is going up this diagram. So this, the um, superscripts represent outcomes. Um, and the subscripts represent incomes. So inputs. The subscripts represent outputs, uh, subscripts represent in inputs. Um, and now we need a little bit more here because in this symbolic notation, uh, we need to say where the wires are going. So I'm going to add some integers. So this wire here, I'll call it wire one. And it goes from box A to box E. And then um, here's another wire goes from box um, A to box C, call that two, uh, and so on. So a total of five wires. And, uh, so we can notate this circuit symbolically in this notation. Um, and in, in this kind of work, it's sometimes advantageous to work in symbolic notation, and sometimes it's advantageous to work in diagrammatic notation. Most of the time, the diagrammatic notation is actually the best notation. Okay. So how, how would we calculate a probability for this uh, situation? 
Um, let me just draw the diagram again. Um, well, in standard quantum theory, you want to calculate the probability of this. What you typically do is you evolve a state forward in time. So you, you start with a foliation, you start with a state here, then you evolve it to this time, new time, and then you evolve it to this time, and then finally you project onto the state at the end. And the way you do that is uh, to calculate the probability to take the trace, of when you take the initial state, the row. Okay, and then the next thing that happens to this state is that it passes through box here. And while over here, you have the existing identity uh, happening. So you do the B. Taken the initial state and now I've evolved it by acting on it with the tensor product of operations, uh, which uh, operation here that we'll call E and an operation here that does nothing, it just leaves it in the state. And then next, I need to evolve it past here. So I need to do the same kind of thing again. I have a box here for C, the identity wire here. Now, finally, I perform a measurement uh, uh, onto, onto the um, associated. Uh, and so this is a way of doing the calculation here. Um, and this, this approach isn't very satisfactory for two reasons. One, you need to introduce a foliation. So the foliation doesn't exist out there in, in nature. It's something you have to um, use in order to do the calculation. And then the second reason is that you treat each of these boxes um, on, on, a, on, a, on a different footing. So you have here a preparation box, which is associated with, with a density matrix. You have here a box, transformation box, which is associated with a what's called Operator. This is a trace um, um, non increasing complete positive map. Here you have a projection operator at the end. Everything is treated on a different footing. And, and so I think so that's not really. Very nice. It'd be nice if you could have a, a treatment where you unify the treatment of all of this uh, and you don't need a foliation. Um, and um, if I can just go back to the previous slide. Um, so it turns out one way to calculate the probability of the circuit uh, is in what I call the operator tensor framework. Uh, and um, this is done by in a certain way by converting each of these objects into an operator. And then whenever you have a repeated index, like here, for example, uh, you have to take the partial trace in those two operators, in the associated part of the Hilbert space. Uh, so uh, in the end, if you take all those partial traces, this will give you a, a probability in the probability of the circuit. Um, and um, yeah, I'm sort of getting short on time, so I don't want, I'm not going to take you into details of how that works. Are there any questions on this? What, what's good about the operator tensor framework is that. Um, you don't have to treat, you don't have to introduce a foliation. You just simply take the circuit and convert it directly into a calculation. And the calculation has the same compositional form 
as as the thing gets a calculation for. So uh, I just have a question that if uh, so, this tensor network formalism is unitary. No, no. So I wouldn't call this. A, so tensor networks are uh, is, is the name that's usually used for something a little bit different. Uh, these are operator tensors. So each each of these objects is an object that has some tensorial structure. Um, um, I mean, but it's related, perhaps, in spirit at least, to the sort of tensor network approach. Um, each of these, so for example, if I take this one here, um, corresponds to this operator here. Um, this this operator here might refer to a non-unitary transformation. In general, it will be a non-unitary transformation. Okay. Yeah, um, it could be unitary, but the most general case is where it, it's non-unitary. Okay. And uh, uh, one more question is this, uh, like, what are the application of this kind of frameworks? Like, so I, as, as I have heard that uh, there is something called many body localization. There uh, maybe people can use that. Is it so? I mean, again, I think that's, that's again, more the tensor network approach. They, they, they generally work on problems like that. Um, I haven't applied that here. The the, the 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 point of this kind of uh, approach is is to provide a, um, a a way of formulating quantum theory um, that um, is uh, is perhaps more natural. Uh, it doesn't rely on introducing the foliation. Uh, you don't have to treat the object okay. um, you're putting, uh, and so and so the interest there is is more fundamental. Um, perhaps this is a way. This is this is a stepping stone in, on on the way to the theory of quantum gravity. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I haven't haven't tried to use this approach to um to those sorts of problems. Um. The, the, you know, like many body localizations. Okay. Okay. Um. Okay. So um, so I I don't want to go on too much over the the two hour mark. Um. So let me um, just talk a little bit about general relativity um, in, in this kind of operational framework. So in general relativity, what you have is you have some fields, which represent them by you have matter fields, and you have the metric fields. Um, and then a solution, what we call a solution U in general relativity, is given by providing this, the fields at each point P e, uh, for all points P in a manifold. Okay, so you have uh, various fields. This might include, you know, um, some, some sort of electromagnetic fields, some fluid dynamical fields, you know, the metric fields. Um, and the solution is given by providing the, um, the fields at each point on, on some manifold. And um, you can act on this with a different morphism. So different morphism is, is, a, is an a map that takes a point P to a new point. So it sort of smoothly transforms points on the um, on the manifold. Uh, so if you do that, you you get a new you, you end up transforming the fields. Um, uh, so you end up affecting a transformation like this, uh, and this 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 representation might look a bit different because the fields have been mapped. And in particular, you have this this part of the manifold. Imagine you have a region here on the manifold uh, with some particular fields in it, with some value some field values in it. So here's, let's call this region A. 
Um, and now you hit to it from morphism, all the fields that were previously uh, in, in here get sort of mapped out, get mapped to a different region, and you end up replacing fields that are in here with points from, from a region over here. So under this diffeomorphism, you've taken all the fields that were previously in this region and they've gone somewhere else and you've brought in fields from a new location. Um, no. Now, it's a principle of general relativity that the, um, what's usually called the observables um, are, um, are, are invariant under diffeomorphisms. So I'm, I'm gonna call these viewables. So Buebles is a, is, a, is a term introduced by John Bell, Bell's inequality of Spain. Um, and this is meant to contain all the real existing properties in your theory. So these are the Buebles. The so Buebles in, in general relativity are functions on your solutions that have the property. That they are invariant under different morphisms. Okay. And so we can see now that um, there are no beables in um, any region, any subregion of the manifold. So we take a region A, any function I might try to define in terms of the fields um, will simply get, will be changed because all those field values will be get sent out to a different region and be replaced with field values from a new, an old, another region. But it's impossible to, to define variables that are local uh, on the manifold. And that's, this is a real problem if you want to do operational physics, because you want to be able to talk about you know, stuff that happens uh, locally. You want to have um, you know, settings and outcomes and so on. And, um, and it looks like it's simply not possible in general relativity. So we need an approach uh, to make that possible. Um, let me sketch uh, how you can do that. And any questions on this? Okay. Um, so here's an approach made that possible. We we had these um, fields uh, and these are in general are our, our, our tensors, but we can extract from these fields, we can define in terms of these fields some scalars. Um, and so these scalars could be, you know, any scalar properties that you're interested in. And this is operational physics. They don't have to be of fundamental significance. These scalars are going to represent um, operational quantities that, that we, uh, the correspond to things that we typically see. So they might, for example, be the, um, the, um, the, the density of, of the elements on the table. Um, or, um, or, you know, some other quantities, some other um, scalars that represent things that we see directly. Um, what we can do then is we can plot a space whose axes correspond to these scalars. Okay, I can only draw um, three of them. But in principle, this space might have more dimensions. It might be um, 10 dimensional, 100 dimensional, um, however many scalars you choose um, to, to talk about the physics you're interested in. Um, now, what you can do is you can take a solution. So remember, it represents a solution like this. Take a solution 
uh, like so. And the solution provides you um, field values at each point on the manifold. You, you, look at, you take a certain point on the manifold, look at these field values, you calculate these scalars, and then you plot a point in here. Then you take a different point in the manifold and do the same thing. And you keep repeating that. And eventually you'll get some kind of surface in here um, of, um, of points of this, is this scalar coincidences that have been plotted uh, from this solution. Uh, and this surface has to have dimension which is um, no bigger than the um, dimension of your space time. It could be smaller but in general, but it's not, but it's not, the dimension of this surface is not bigger than the dimension of the manifold. Um, okay, so now um, we have this surface here. And one thing that's interesting about this surface is that if we hit this um, solution with a diffeomorphism, well, a diffeomorphism doesn't change um, the values of the scalars, map them to a new point, but any, any coincidences in the values of scalars will remain unchanged in the diffeomorphism. So a point in here doesn't move. If we hit this with a different morphism, and the point stays the, 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 the point stays where it is. So this surface that I've plotted stays where it is too. So this is a good candidate for um, something we actually observe. And now the idea is to set up an operational approach in terms of, um, in, in, in terms of this. And what we can do is we can consider small boxes and regions inside this space. We call this space the operational space. Or small boxes inside here, those small boxes might intersect this surface. Um, and so that here's one small box called that box A. Um, and um, yeah, so so we've we, so we've we've started with a general solution. We have the problem that we couldn't talk about properties inside a region of the manifold. However, we can talk about properties in a region of this operational space. Because if we hit this with a diffeomorphism, it's, the surface stays where it is. So properties inside this box A remain unchanged in the diffeomorphism, so they are beables. And um, what we can do is we can um, draw different boxes. So here's another box here. Diagram is a bit added. And this might also intersect um, the surface. Um, so we can think of in each of these boxes, we can one of these boxes here. We can think of this box uh, of the uh, as corresponding to one of our operations where the outcome is the particular surface we get inside here because this surface could have been somewhere else, or it might not be in there at all. But the outcome relates to where this surface is uh, uh, inside this box. And, and you can set up general relativity in terms of these operations. And so I'm gonna turn that operation into a, into a circle. And then we have two operations like A and B, and they're touching each other in operational space. And you can represent that by two circles, have a, have a, um, a surface connecting them. So that surface I represent by uh, A and so on. And, um, and then you can draw it, you can have a more general situation where I have various, various um, of these boxes which are in contact with one another. Uh, and then I can draw the circuit corresponding to that. And then in this context, you can do um, a calculation. Uh, so I have a paper on this, it's on the archive from I think 2016. Uh, and you can set up a possibilistic calculation. So you can ask questions like, um, is a certain configuration as described by this circuit an actual situation that is possible according to the rules of general relativity or is it impossible? Um, this is reminiscent of Penrose's um, impossible triangle. So that's a diagram. You can describe it in compositional terms, but it, it actually corresponds to something that's impossible. 
Yeah. Uh, so here you have these diagrams, these circuits, and some of them will correspond to equations that are actually physically possible. Yeah. Uh, and so we have a cal calculus for determining uh, whether there's a possible or not. But this is a way of describing general relativity in operational terms. Um, and um, I think I'll, since we're just over two hours, I'll, um, I'll, 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 I'll just see if there's any questions on, on this approach to general relativity, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. Okay. So, um, so I, what I've done in this in this uh, presentation is try to present to you various um, sort of ideas on operational physics, how you can formulate quantum theory and general relativity in operational terms. And, and the bigger goal is to get to a theory of quantum gravity. Here I'm proposing a sort of operational methodology to do that. So um, the questions uh, are, you know, what is the correct mathematical framework within which to find a theory of quantum gravity? And I proposed that it should be an operational framework uh, and also one that admits indefinite causal structure. Um, of course, you know, there are many possible approaches to quantum gravity, so this is just um, the approach that I'm doing. And then two, once you have this general mathematical framework, uh, what are the, the principles or, or axioms um, that you can impose um, to get you down to an actual theory of quantum gravity? So the, the analogous questions, you know, in the case of general relativity, Einstein had to find the sort of mathematical framework consisting of, um, you know, manifolds and tensors living on manifolds and so on. And within that framework, he was then able to use the equivalence principle and other principles to get down to the particular equation that he was uh, looking for. Um, so we can ask uh, analogous questions uh, in this case. Um, and um, yeah, there's lots of work uh, on this. There's a lot of people working um, on approaches to physics in general. And there's uh, increasingly a sub-community of people who are interested in um, an operational approach to theory of quantum gravity. So people in, in uh, Vienna, in um, in um, Germany, of course, in, in Pavia, in Oxford, um, and many other places around the world, Brussels. Um, and so, so you know, if this is something you're interested in, then um, then you know, look up the, the papers and uh, see if it's something you want to work with. Um, okay, I'll stop there. Uh. Thank you for your contribution and uh, uh, please ask a question uh, if you uh, anything have. So how would we get uh, Einstein equation in this case? Yeah, um, in, in which case in the, um, are you asking would, in which case? Cause I presented various different things. So um, like in, in this uh, operational framework, 
Okay. Um, let me. So, so I gave an operational framework for, for general relativity. Yeah. I still have the um, slides for that. Um, so in some sense, the framework I was giving you was 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 a, was a framework of sort of general theories of that form, theories that are diffeomorphic invariant. Yeah, where you have field equations. So um, not similar to the, the case that Einstein considered. But the, the place where they fit in is is, is here. Um, so if this is a solution. Um, then, then, um, then every point, every point here, you have to satisfy not only the Einstein field equations, but also the other field equations that come by um, by applying the minimal coupling principle to, to the special equations. You know, I've seen general relativity. You have a in, in general you have um, um, yes. The general relativity kind of consists of three parts. You have a you have a prescription for turning special relativity, special relativity field equations into general relativity field equations, um, and and that's the um, the the the, the, you know, the, the, the common to semicolon. Uh, what you do there is you you take um, you replace coordinates in um, in the um, you replace coordinates in a flat space time with general coordinates. You replace the Minkowski metric with the general metric. You replace the um, the partial derivative with the covariant derivative. Um, the second thing you have, so when you do this, what happens is you um, you start off with a set of equations that are complete. So if you have a sufficient initial information, you can solve. Or if you have sufficient boundary information, you can solve the equations completely. But when you introduce g mu nu, you end up with um, um, an extra 10 parameters that you didn't have previously. Minkowski metric is constant. So, um, so although you started off with a set of equations that were complete, you end up with a set of equations that's um, under complete because you don't have need an extra ten equations. So, so that's that's where the um, Einstein field equation comes in. It's kind of an addendum, um, and those are the Einstein field equations. Um, is um, all around. Um, just basically, the T, the G mu nu is um, uh, the Einstein field. Of, uh, the Einstein tensor is equal to um, T mu nu, constant. Um, now the problem is that this this Einstein um, tensor is satisfies a uh, an identity that its covariant derivative is equal to zero. So although you have ten equations here, you actually don't have. It turns out that 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 four of them are are are, are not there. So you really only have six equations here, and that's why you need the interpretation. Um, that says that beables are the things that are invariant under different organs. That I talked about before. Um, um, so general relativity is this kind of complete package. So you have a set of field equations that consist of ones you get from special relativity plus the Einstein field equations. Um, so now, when you when you look at something like this, if this is to be a solution, it has to be a solution to all of the field equations, not just the Einstein field equation. Um, and and now, if you want to, um, 
do something like like what I was describing here, where you where you, you join these boxes. When when you join these boxes of these lines, you have to check two things. First of all, you have to it has to be the case that this inside the box, um, this is an allowed patch. So it has to correspond to something that satisfies all of the field equations, including Einstein's field equation. And secondly, uh, at the boundary where this joins with another box, which represents here or just here, um, you have to be sure that your matching conditions are such that you satisfy uh, all of the field equations uh, across that boundary. Um, and um, it's in doing that calculation that you holistic framework. Yeah, so, so that, that's an answer to, to your question. Um, what, what doesn't happen so far, as I have it, is you don't get a very elegant um, relation of the Einstein field equations. They don't come out of this way of thinking about things in an elegant fashion. And I would say that's a deficiency in so far as they developed it. Yeah, okay. okay, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Any other questions or comments? If not, then please uh, clap for Professor Hardy for giving such an outstanding contribution. Um, uh, please unmute yourselves and please give a clap for him. And uh, this talk will be posted in YouTube and I will share the link with you, Professor, uh, once you. it is uploaded. And thank you very much for your uh, great contribution and it, it will be surely helpful for those who have attended and those who not able to attend, they can able to see them, them uh, the talk in YouTube. And thank you very much. And thank you. Yeah, it's like very elaborative and very useful for everyone. And uh, it's almost two and a half hours. And right now it is 1030 almost. And you were yeah. already very tired. <laughs> after giving such a big talk. So I used to not, not call it talk because talk shouldn't uh, go for that long. I used to call it lecture. That's why yeah. it's a little bit big. Uh, hope you have enjoyed the lecture. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. It was a great experience. So thank you for organizing it. Thank you. Okay. You. Stay safe and healthy. And uh, you. You uh, too. see you. Bye. See you. Bye bye.